Hello, everyone. My name is Kristen Snowden. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist in the state of California. Um, and this is a free live webinar that we have once monthly. Well, they happen every time this Wednesday at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time through sexandrelationshiphealing.com. But I am here usually the second Wednesday of every month, and you can check them out also on my YouTube channel. But I am when we have our webinars, I cover various topics related to our relationships, um, that there's so many things that show up in our relationship when we show up to be seen and love others. Um, and in this particular case, we talk a lot about addiction recovery, sex addiction recovery, betrayed partners and betrayal, because that is a lot of who is in this audience, but really a lot of these concepts are things that I see across the board in all coupleships. Um, so I'd encourage everyone to chime in. But today we are going to talk about being angry and betrayed. Um, there are so many emotions that we go through when we are in a relationship crisis. Um, we run through the gamut of emotions from feeling shocked, fear, disbelief, grief, bewilderment, confusion. There are so many things that betrayed partners go through when they uncover that their trusted, loving, loved, intimate partner has been lying to them. And that's through various channels. It could be just like financial infidelity, an emotional affair, a real affair, you know, a, a very thorough affair, let's say, because um, they all are painful and they're all betrayal, sex addiction, porn use, et cetera, there, or even just emotional abuse, like severe gaslighting and emotionally abusive behaviors. Betrayed partners run a huge gamut of emotion when they're experiencing these kind of things in life. But I find one of the most interesting emotions that some partners go through is anger. Why do I say it's interesting? Because as a clinician who deals with betrayed partners all the time, the subject of anger and the judgment around it seems to be the strongest of all. So when I say judgment, there'll be betrayed partners. I run some betrayed partners groups and there'll be judgment towards the betrayed partner who was too angry, who smashed too many plates, who said too many threatening things to their partner. And then conversely, there'll be judgment um, about like betrayed partners who are not angry enough, you know, that their partners are relapsing over and over again and they're not experiencing anger. And so, I, and I've gotten email too from clients who've kind of said, how do I harness my anger? I'm having a really hard time feeling angry coming from my place of anger. And then I have other clients who come to me and say, how do I push the anger aside and move towards healing um, and trying to rebuild connection because I'm just too angry. So I always find it interesting though, the huge spectrum of experiences people have. And so I really wanted to focus this webinar on talking about how anger might show up or not show up in a betrayed partner's experience. Um, because sometimes it can be considered productive. Sometimes it can be considered unproductive. It can help or hinder the healing process. Sometimes stepping into anger will feel necessary and deserving. And other times when someone steps into anger, it'll feel wrong or shameful. And some of you might not even be able to access anger or not anger, but just notice that in the face of anger, they will just sh entirely shut down and dissociate. So we have a, a, we run the gamut of, on the topic of anger. Um, and so really exploring how anger might play a role in the betrayed partner's healing process can help all of us become more mindful about how it might show up in our life. Um, is, is our anger and our response in the state of anger and our behaviors that we might say or do in the state of anger, is it working for us, for the relationship? Do we feel like we need to access more of it? 
does it feel powerful or does it feel shaming? Um, who have been the examples of anger? How do we know how to show anger in our life? What have been our role models of anger? Do we fear anger or do we kind of revel in it? Is it, is it what we feel most comfortable? Is it the emotion we feel most comfortable with? At the end of this um, quick discussion on anger, I'm going to be doing an exercise to explore our relationship with anger. It's kind of an internal family systems process where I'm going to ask you to go inside and kind of explore a little bit about what anger means to you and what's underneath the anger and how we can use it in the most helpful or healing way. So let's just talk a little bit about anger. <clears throat> when, if you read any of these um, sex and relationship healing uh, articles or other blogs related to like sex addiction or uncovering your partner's infidelity um, or going through this, this crisis, there's some like do's and don'ts, you know, this is how you should respond. This is what you should be doing to protect yourself. Um, and let's make this very clear. I think all professionals in this field who are helping clients or individuals heal after betrayal or after uncovering covering such a devastating um, reality of lying and manipulation and your loved one living a double life. I think all professionals welcome the emotion of anger so no emotion is not welcome as it's very understandable that it would surface. However, there is often um, clinicians will discourage acts of violence or emotional abuse or severe shaming that might occur as a result of someone being in the state of anger. And that would go both ways, right? For the addict and for the betrayed partner. But still, there seems to be um, amongst the, the betrayed partners um, community, this vacillating opinion um, about the role anger should or shouldn't play in the betrayed partner's life as a consequence of uncovering betrayal. Um, and so meaning, like I said, that there's this, like I have every right to throw dishes, to say, I regret marrying you and you're the weakest, most horrible human being in the world, um, kind of, no holds barred, all bets are off. I'm allowed to do whatever I want in the state, um, you know, after finding out what I found out. And then there are some people who feel very differently about that. Um, I want you to understand that anger is a very tricky emotion. There is so much underneath the anger. So this is um, kind of a classic thing that we all learn in therapy school. Uh, about anger. And I'm going to share this for a visual. So the, imagine an iceberg. If you've ever seen it on a national geographic magazine, um, there's ice floating up at the surface, but you know that there's a huge, deep, deep, um, you know, the rest of the iceberg is floating underneath the water. So we use that metaphor to help you understand that on the top, on the surface, you'll see anger, but underneath there is so, there's so much more. Um, when you look at, if you look up, you know, type in anger iceberg, you'll see a lot of different um, worksheets on it, which might be helpful if you're working out your anger and how it shows up in your life and what it means to you. But I think the two main things that show up when someone shows up in a state of anger is fear um, and hurt and fear of loss, et cetera. There's other things. Some people can be stressed, anxious, tired, frustrated, all these other things. Um, but I'm just trying to help you see that when someone shows up in a state of anger, it's not just because they are angry. There's other things going on. Um, so let's explore everyone's perception and experience with anger. So if you can kind of go inside and take a minute and Think of a time either recently or in the past and let that image kind of pass by you when you felt stressed, angry, exhausted, wronged, like you have been, someone has hurt you, harmed you. Maybe you feel unseen, unheard, misunderstood, or you feel like someone that you loved has, has betrayed you or hurt you. Now, Thinking up in that image as you have it pass through you, do you feel anger? Do you get 
angry? If so, when you think of that image and that time or that memory, how did you respond to those feelings and sensations of anger? Would you share the story about how you responded in anger with somebody else? Or do you have an instinct to keep it secret and say, oh, I would never tell anyone that that's how I reacted. You know, that's what I said to my kids. That's what I said to my partner. That's what I did at work. Is it something, because your willingness to share it with someone else versus keep it as your deep, dark secret is an indicator of how much shame you might associate with, with your response, with your anger. Um, are you proud of your response, of, of your anger? Or do you wish that maybe you could be better at controlling it? Do you like who you are when you're angry? Because sometimes people feel very powerful in that state. Or is there a part of you that is almost angry that you're not getting angry enough? that you're not having a strong enough reaction in you to speak up, say something, do something. And I think you'll notice just from the, those who are showing up today in this webinar, there'll be a variation of, of feelings and experiences with that example. And if you can all you know, chime in and say what your experience is with anger, either receiving it or feeling it in yourself and acting out as a consequence of it. Um, I think it'll be interesting to see. So let's notice the differences amongst us and let's figure out how, what anger means to us and where it came from. So first and foremost, anger is a, a primal emotion. You know, it's kind of back there in that hippocampus, like that fear response. It's that quick caveman you can get angrier. You can access anger faster than a lot of different emotions um, because it tends to trigger like the sympathetic part of your nervous system. And if you remember from my you know, autonomic nervous system lectures that I've had before, sympathetic is that poking, irritating state in your nervous system that's saying, do something, you know, don't just stand here, do something, say something, act in a certain way. Because anger is kind of saying the state, the state of this current relationship or the state of what's going on in this world or the state of what's going on um, in my life and my reality is unacceptable and I'm angry about it. So what am I going to do about it? A lot of people do things in the state of anger. It can ignite change, different movement. It's also really important for you to explore what was the role of anger in your family system? You know, did your immediate family get angry? Were you the angry one? Maybe was there someone who was so angry all the time? You know, I've had clients who had a, a sibling that was angry and so violent that they don't access anger very well. In fact, any topic around something really uncomfortable or a loud voice or someone moving their hands will cause them to shut down and dissociate. And they're like, not with us anymore because the trauma of what they saw and experienced, the fear, the powerlessness of someone else being in anger causes their nervous system to just shut down. So if you could imagine getting angry at someone in, with that trauma history, that's not gonna be very productive if you're working towards change, trying to change something. Conversely, maybe you came from a place in a family system where you were taught anger is inappropriate. You don't, you know, scream or yell or stomp your feet or have tantrums, or maybe you would, but no one would respond to it. So it wasn't something that actually got attention. Um, when you, you can't talk about anger without talking about gender roles, you know, it's, it's commonly said that men are allowed like two emotional states, no feelings or angry, you know, and they're not really allowed to be hurt or depressed or scared. Um, they, you know, just culturally, we've given them permission to have those two states. Um, and sometimes women are told, oh yeah, you can be sad or depressed or anxious, but ang angry, just, you know, no one wants to marry that. No one wants to date a, an angry person. 
that's not very um, fitting and you're, you're not going to get a partner that way. So pay attention to the, the gender rule, rules you have been told. So there's rules that came from your family system about what emotions are okay, what aren't okay, rules from your society of, of what's okay and not okay. And then the bigger question it has to be, how is anger showing up in your relationship dyad, right? Because most of you are chiming in because you're in some kind of relationship crisis. Bad stuff has gone down. You're either working on repairing individually and moving forward in the healthiest way from here on out, or you're trying to repair that current relationship. So you have to look at how is anger showing up in this relationship. As I mentioned, anger often comes because we're in a, we have seen a reality or we feel something that we want to change, that we don't like this current situation. We don't like who you're being. We don't like what's happening. I don't like how you see me. I don't like that you're not listening. I don't like that this is happening. And so anger can often be this igniting, I want to create change. But is your angry response or lack thereof actually leading to that change occurring in your relationship dyad? Sometimes your partner needs to see you angry. Sometimes they need to say, like, you have reached your end. You are not responding to anything I have tried love. I have tried forgiveness. I have tried compassion. I have tried begging and pleading. I have tried telling you how much you've hurt me and those aren't working. And anger might end up being the only language that they hear and respond to. Conversely, anger might be so present in you, kind of just ready to explode all day, every day. You know, they ask, where do you want to eat? Or ask them to remind you when you're supposed to pick up the kids. And you have anger exploding out of you at every second. That might be something you want to work on further because that might cause your partner or even the family system to just kind of want to shut down, right? So You want to just not explore how anger shows up in your life, but how it is working in your family system, in your relationship dyad. And I want to add, by the way, two things before we go into this exercise to kind of go inside and explore anger in your own life, which is that none of this discussion on anger is ever meant to be blaming or shaming. Let's be honest. We are emotional beings and every single one of us has let our emotions get the best of us. We are not robots. We feel, we hurt, we bleed, we're scared, and we react out of those states. So it's not about maybe something you did that you're not proud of, um, but it's about the fact that now that you know better, now that you've done the work to know what's underneath that anger, that you really do the work to figure out what what am I really trying to get when I'm in that state of anger? What are all the different emotions? What's the story I'm telling myself that's making me so angry? What do I want? What do I need? And, and is this the most productive way to get what I want and what I need? Um, what kind of boundaries have to be set up? What kind of self-care am I needing to do? to help with all those underlying needs and that iceberg of needs that are underneath that anger. Because this is the deal, folks. Your addict partner, you know, your partner who betrayed you, who did all these hurtful, nefarious acts, they did these things due to a lack of connection with themselves, a lack of an awareness of their own emotional state. You know, they had trauma or bad things happen, or they never built up a tolerance of how to deal with uncomfortable emotions, shame, uh, disappointment, depression, anxiety, all those kind of things. So they would act out everything. They would unknowingly act out in their trauma, in their state of discomfort, um, and seek out intensity, numbing behavior, pleasure, and manipulation, all 
all instead of staying aligned with their values and their goals and their promises that they've kept to their loved ones. They did all of these things because they were not emotionally intelligent. They were not aware of their emotional state. So you want to make sure that you don't match that behavior. Stuff happens when we're angry, when we're hurt, when we're scared, but we want to always do the extra work to take that inventory and say, whew, what just happened there? That was a really strong response. Is that how I want to show up? You know, is there a better way? Is there a way that I can say this? Do I, you know, is anger okay, but maybe I don't want to accompany it with these words and these behaviors Um, is, you know, Am I, it's a cue maybe that I need to improve my self-care, et cetera. So really take the time doing some work on your anger can be really productive, but let's talk a little bit about, let's do a little exercise on figuring out how anger might or might not show up in your life and why, what you want to do about it. So kind of take a minute to take a deep breath. We've been on this topic of anger. We talked about, you know, having a recent memory or a distant memory when you felt wronged or scared or hurt or not seen, unloved. Um, And can you kind of find that part of your body that feels the anger? Can you kind of go inside and identify the anger? Or if you're feeling even like a numbness, so I have this memory of being hurt or rejected or betrayed or lied to, and I have this numbness, like I'm not accessing feelings, then just focus in on that. Notice that. Notice this, this kind of numbness, this inability to access my anger. So focus in on that and see if you can kind of find it in your body. Where do you feel it? Can you see it? You know, does an image pop up in your head? If so, what does it look like? Some of us have like a very clear image of what anger looks like, an image of seeing it or us doing it, experiencing it. Um, So there might be, I want you to notice as you're exploring this topic of anger where it shows up in your body or this numbing, so dissociative part of you that resists anger. There's other parts that might jump in. There are parts that'll be like, nope, don't go there. Once you open up that um, huge dam, you ain't going to pull it back in together. Or, you know, if you really access how much anger you have towards this person, you might murder them. (laughs) So don't, don't go there, lock it up. Or, oh, if you access anger, they might not love you anymore. That'll be it. That'll put the nail in the coffin to this relationship, and then you will be alone, you'll be getting divorced, etc. So just flesh out what pops up as you access this anger, as it shows up in your body. And what the internal family system says is these are just, you know, protector parts that come in or managers that come in to say, oh, no, 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 this is how you need to act. This is what's okay. This is what's not okay. Um, And then as you notice those parts, just kind of validate why each of those parts are coming in. You know, they're trying to protect you. Maybe they might make you space out and not and numb and not feel anymore because it's trying to manage you. Maybe um, have you get defensive, have you get nervous. They're all made to play a role in your life to keep you going, right? And you can kind of thank them. You all, everyone who's here has been in a serious relationship crisis. And to date, you've survived. And you've survived through managing your emotions and these deep, devastating, overwhelming, physiological, overwhelming sensations you have in your body where you don't know how you've survived, but somehow you have. And that is a testament to kind of all the managers you have in your body trying to get you to just put one foot in front of the other. So you can kind of take a minute, even though maybe it's not been the best version of you and just like, thank them. You have let me survive. So the goal of going back to that part, that angry part, or that numbed out dissociative part is to just really start getting to know that part. Um, 
the theory is that the IFS theory is that when we experience trauma, something overwhelming to our system throughout our childhood, it creates these parts, you know, this is what anger is. No, don't do anger. Um, and it blocks access to our own self energy, so to speak that, you know, now I'm an adult, I have the resources, I have the knowledge, I have the understanding to be who I want to be. Um, but these parts don't really know that yet. They still are that scared child. They're still that, that, that child that's been told you can't have emotion or girls don't get angry or, you know, don't say this or don't do this. Um, so just kind of get to know why that part is showing up, um, what it's trying to do and what its goals are. And most importantly, what it's afraid of. So um, if you can focus in on that sensation, that anger, and kind of ask these questions of like, how do you, as in like me, Kristen, feel towards this part, this angry sensation in me, or this fact that I can't access anger, this nummy, you know, am I mad at it? Am I angry? Am I curious? Do I understand why it's there? And then kind of ask, you can actually go inside and ask like, all right, angry part, what do you want me to know? and see what it says. It can be like, well, this is unacceptable. You have been treated the wrong way for too many years. I need, I have got to fight for you. If you're not going to fight for you, I'm going to fight for you and see what it's saying. You know, what does it want from you? Um, what are images and memories related to the state? And really it's very interesting to, to figure out how you feel towards that part, what it's experiencing, the stories and the memories and the trauma that it has around it, inside it, um, and really try to access it, as they say in IFS, like befriend the part. Understand what its job is, what it's trying to do, why it's showing up. And then if it has any fears, right? If it didn't show up as an angry, dish-throwing, expletive, screaming person, then what? What would happen? Or conversely, if it didn't show up as someone who just shut all your emotions down and got you to just feel nothing, then what? What's afraid would happen if it stepped aside and didn't do that? And so these can be really great topics to take into your therapist's office, into your groups. Um, I have a betrayed partners group that's starting August 18th. Um, there's still a few spots left. You can go to kristensnowden.com. And we talk about all these things, right? We run the gamut of emotions. All emotions are welcome. We just really want to be mindful of how they show up. Do they show up in the way that's best for us, for our healing journey and how they're showing up in our relationships? And that's it. Oh, but it's such a great topic. And I think it's really important, like you were talking about, to understand what its role is, what it's trying to do, what it's trying to protect you from or show you or whatever. And like you said, what is it trying to tell me? I've done the exploration. I understand. I don't have to experience it on that level anymore. I, I hear from partners, and I know you do too, you know, that they don't like who they become. And so, you know, that feels like it's too much, but, but the, you know, the flip side of not having any isn't okay either. So, so finding that, that middle ground of like, you know, where is, you know, the right amount that does serve me, that is useful, you know, that isn't shutting me down, that is able to be heard, you know, how do we do that? Um, it's, it's important work. So there's lots of, um, uh, stuff in the so I have experienced anger in all the ways you're speaking of from rage to shutting down and interesting that it's the you know the spectrum you know because I was kind of wondering if people have more of like this is where I go to or if there is that spectrum so this particular person is talking about you know they are on the spectrum of you know, either raging or shutting down your thoughts on that um, no, it's, it's, it's all purposeful. Um, I think in the IFS world, they'd say 
anger, it, those are different parts, right? There's an anger part oh. that comes in and then there's the um, shutdown part that kind of shuts you down for a reason because um, it's afraid of something happening too. And so it's really interesting to kind of identify both those parts, figure out the stories that are going on, you know, where, where did you get the story of anger and how you need to show up with that? And then why does something come in and shut you down? You know, what is, what is it, what is it trying to do? What is it afraid is going to happen if it doesn't shut down that anger? And what's the point of where it's taking you too far? Because the theory is, is that if we cleared out all this anger and shame and the, I should be this, and this is what, and we had just ourself, you know, Kristen, the person that's learned from my mistakes, has trauma, but it's healed, it's processed everything, is connected with my emotions, knows what my values and goals are. If I came from that place in space, I would be coming from self energy. You know, I'd have conf- they have these all these C's, confidence, compassion, um, et cetera, where it's I can come and react from that state versus if I have that really angry um, explosion or I have this very numb down, shut down state, these are kind of my parts. These are like my hurt, as you know, I, uh, Eddie Kepperich, you might say like the wounded children that are coming out from, from history. So um, it's a very interesting, like I said, you can take just the single topic or experience of anger and there's so much more underneath it. It would be interesting with this person's um, share too, if, in certain with certain people or certain situations the anger and with other people or situations there's the shutdown like you know are there safe people to be angry at and then there's other people that are not safe to to display that so uh, it, it, there's right. a lot I mean, here. the perfect metaphor or not example would be teenagers right they're usually are most angry with the ones they feel safest with, right? Their family system, their Their a-holes to like, (laughs) right. A-holes to mom and dad, because that, that part has said there that is allowed, right. That's safe for you to practice Mm -hmm. anger over here, but there's another like manager part over here. That's like, Oh, but don't be an a-hole to your friends because you need to be a part of your social network. We need you to gain acceptance and validation from this source. So you need to act a certain way, do this, don't do this, kind of play the game and do the roles in order to mm-hmm. keep connection in this area of your life. So it's all informative. Yeah, that's a great analogy too. So, okay. This other person shares reactive anger. My family sees me as angry, but they are poking me constantly and I try, but then just enter the fray yeah and the next per go ahead it's just you know explore what is getting poked what is the story you tell yourself before you enter the fray um why is it that you feel that anger is the the last resort um yeah and, and again it's not a blaming shaming on your part there's no doubt you might be getting poked what are they trying to do and say when they are poking you? They're obviously trying to trigger change, trigger something in you, trigger, you know, or who knows? They might not be. They might just be having a bad day. They might be in their own state of insecurity and shame. So then the question would be, why are you taking everything personally? Why are you defensive about something that they're doing or dealing with? All, again, information for you to process. Yeah, and like I, I I've, I, I learn from all of all of these great people that are, are on here sharing and, you know, and I've shared this, you know, that I finally realized I have abandonment wounds and when they get poked, whoever's doing the poking, you know, like I, I have the language now to go, oh, that's my abandonment wound getting poked and I need to go do something productive for me. I remove myself from the whatever, from the fray and I go do self care so that I'm showing up differently and understand it's my wound you know, and whatever they're doing, I can participate, but I don't have to, if I, you know, if if I take, and and I can have anger about like, I mean, there have been some legitimate things where it really is an abandonment. Well, you know, was that person trying to be cruel? Probably not. Maybe, I don't know, (laughs) but I, it was more about me. Like, how do I want, how do I want to take care of me in this, you know, because just feeling sorry for myself was not, helpful for me, you know, and I'm just saying for me, you know, um, that is not a good space for 
for me to go to. So, okay. The next one, unfaithful. I feel angry all the time. I stomp on it and I feel deep shame when I lose my temper. It makes me, it makes it hard for me to be there for my spouse. This is the the person that was the betrayer because her pain makes her lash out at me and I respond in anger. So that's that dance I was talking about. You guys, you know, are, are doing the dance. So, mm. but I mean, I think that, like you said, it's and what's underneath it all for anger, There's many yeah. things underneath being unseen, misunderstood, uh, being betrayed, being hurt, uh, not being forgiven, being feel like you're still being punished for something when you've tried to do everything to repair it, feeling like you're never going to get out of this cycle. Um, Yeah, there's so much. And I would invite you, is there a way uh, when you're not in that space, when you're not angry and lashing out to have a discussion about like, you know, this isn't serving either of us well, is there a different way we can do this? And, you know, and work together on having that plan. You may need to have a qualified professional help with that. I mean, that's, you know, that's some big time, ask. So when, when, especially so fresh, which it feels like it is, um, you know, when there's the lashing and anger and all of that, you know, you you, having a qualified professional assist, you know, and help you come up with a plan and some strategies for how you, you know, can navigate that could be, you know, could get you out of that unhealthy dance. Yeah. Or the physiology of anger, Mm because anger is very physical and you can kind of backdoor you know, you're going to explode, you know, you're going to say dumb stuff or do really things that you regret that you're going to do because your body will first tell you, you'll feel your body, you know, heat up, your heart rate will go up, your, your breath gets more shallow. These are all indicators, right? That you're in that sympathetic fight, flight, freeze kind of state. And you can prep yourself that you're there by the physicality of it first, and then, you know, use your coping skills as a consequence. I need to take a break. I'm getting really angry. I'm getting overwhelmed, feeling flooded. I, you know, I need to call my sponsor. I need to go to my women's group or men's group, things like that. Okay. So we have some questions. Thank you so much for this topic. This is so good to hear because I have not been feeling angry or devastation. I was feeling like I'm crazy and there must be something wrong with me because I'm not feeling. I know in my head, I feel like I should feel more emotions about this. I just feel sad, alone, numb. I've been living with an active addict for 12 years. DJ was 11 years ago and I'm still living with him. And we are in home separation at the moment because he is not following my boundaries. But I need to do more how do I learn to feel so that I have the drive to do more? So I feel because this person says, I feel so stuck. Thank right. You. So I'd go back and try to do some meditation on this numbness. If you can really identify how it kind of like, I have clients that will literally feel like it kind of just swallows up their body and takes their sensation away. Um, you can even maybe like type in uh IFS, so internal family systems and um, anger or dissociation or anger and numbing. And those will kind of take you into the different parts, right? That, that your body is made to feel this, but that gets a little too overwhelming to your body. So it comes in and numbs you. That might've been a um, coping skill that you learned for back when you were a child, you know, there, there might be someone telling you, it's not attractive. If you get angry, girls don't scream or girls don't cry. Right. And so this is all, these are the layers that are quashing that angry response. And so you need to kind of peel them back. And as they say in the IFS world, like befriend them, get to know them. Why are they there? What, what is the story they're telling you? What, what, what job are they doing by showing up and numbing you out? Um, and what are they afraid is going to happen and see what comes up, you know, obviously ideally do this work with a therapist, but there are like meditations and stuff that you can do within your, you know, in, on your own, if you feel safe to do so. Okay. Next question. I am dealing with anger toward my soon to be ex-mother-in-law. 
She has victim blame me or excused my husband's bad behavior. And I tried to coordinate with her to see my children, her grandbabies, and she will not answer my texts. In dealing with extended family, what do you suggest? Oh, that's so tough. Yeah, it is. Um, Well, don't forget when we're trying to do relating with other humans, we have to gauge their capacity to do difficult work, right? I could bend myself into a pretzel trying to be a more complex, higher frequency quality human being. But if we're still talking to someone who always wants to act out of like stonewalling, so I'm not gonna talk to her, I'm not gonna return texts. Um, I don't wanna sit down and have a real conversation about what's going on. I only talk about the weather and how your car's running. Um, It's like trying to get water out of a dry well. So in those cases, you know, I say there's like a column people where you can do this tough dance Mm -hmm. with, where you can learn to have tough conversations. And, you know, when I am angry, this is what's really going on in me. And when you are angry with me, this is how my body reacts to it. And I'd really like to get to a better place where we can, you know, instead of being angry, we respond this way or talk, right? Those are your column A people. They've shown the ability to have hard conversations, do hard things hear you, you know, you can hear them and you guys work together to be like better human beings. And then there's column B people who, um, you have to have them in your life, right? So this is the kids want to have a grandma and have grandma in their life, but she's just not capable to have hard conversations. So you might just need to be having her in the place where she's in that like, okay, I guess grandma only gets to see you if she's not returning my text I guess you only get to see grandma when she's with dad because I I, she's not returning my text like I don't know what to do about that so um yeah just be careful you're not trying to get water from a dry well if they're not able to have hard conversations or show any desire to repair have a productive you know relationship um then yeah, it's just not going to work. I've put in the chat um, uh, Kristen's um, website so you can find her uh, groups. Um, she's got more than that, but she's got one starting August 18th. We have the Betrayed Partner um, work group starting August 17th on Seeking Integrity, too. So there are other resources. There's lots of resources. We have sex addiction. Yeah. We have Sex Addiction 101 and Porn Addiction 101, both starting this Saturday. So, okay, this one, I'm pretty angry. My partner is slow, is so slow to move forward and still does things that are not acceptable, like flirting and and have have to be spoken to about it. Like he does not know it's wrong. Right. Um, I hear you. I understand why you're angry. Um, It'll be really interesting for you to kind of maybe start listing out the story you're telling yourself underneath the anger. So when you see your partner flirt and you find yourself explaining, you know, for the 19th time, why it's inappropriate that he's engaging that person in that way, how it makes you feel um, that, you know, you have all these wounds and every time that happens, it feels like it just scrapes that wound open. So it can't heal. And then, you know, he talks about maybe how you're too nagging and too angry and too negative and you'll, you won't forgive him. Um, you can say all these behaviors just rip open the wound again. And that's why you get this, you know, anger, like I said, is a sympathetic state. It's a state that's saying the current state that you're in your current environment is not okay. You need to change something. And anger is a very visceral experience to say, do something, you know, you're hurt, you're scared, something bad's going to happen. Something's you're fearing the future. You're anxious about the present, fearing what's going to happen. You're, you're scared for your safety, scared for your kid's safety. These are all things that you need to kind of journal on, collect your thoughts because you need to start figuring out, okay, if he continues to show that he is not able to make me feel safe, because I have this laundry list of really scary, uncomfortable emotions, then what do I need to do to keep myself safe, to keep myself sane? What kind of boundaries have to be set up? Um, How do I need to change things in my life and way I'm interacting with him 
and others to, to deal with this laundry list of stuff that's going on in my life. And then we've got a couple of people have added some things to the chat. This is a great question. Is resentment the same as anger? It feels similar. So again, that exercise that I gave you will answer that question for you. So if you can go inside and you can feel that resentment in your body, identify it, really focus in on that part of your body that feels resentment. Ask yourself, how do you feel towards it? You know, do you like it there? Do you not like it there? Is it working for you? Is it not working for you? And, and start exploring, you know, what is this resentment trying to tell me? What do you want me to know? What is it reflecting? Um, can I think back to time and place and memories where I felt that resentment? Um, is it not feeling seen, heard? Is it feeling like unappreciated? All that kind of stuff. What would it need to not feel that resentment? You know, there again, there's just so much information. So is it the same as anger? No, they're, they're different emotions, just like, you know, grief and sadness, they can be similar, but different. Um, but they're all informative. They emotions have entire novels written around them. You just need to kind of take the time. We are not a emotionally intelligent society. We are not taught to spend time with our emotion, to sit with our emotion. Um, we're taught to kind of like hit the easy button and seek out pleasure, run from pain, pop that pill, you know, do the six mm-hmm. steps to get out of whatever you're supposed to get out of, um, perform, perform, perfect. So we don't do uncomfortable emotions very well. This is an invitation for you to kind of take that really uncomfortable emotion and instead of pushing it away, go inward and dive into it and start seeing what, what story it's trying to tell you. Okay. So the next one, I feel like when I get triggered or angry, my addict fiance will say things like, you need to figure out if you're okay with feeling this way, because I don't know how long it'll take me to get better. When, when I don't tell him my emotions, he seems to take the peace for granted and continues to do the things he does. How do I communicate to him that this is not okay? At what point do I just give up and realize I should not waste any more time hoping to change? Hmm. So similar to the answer I gave um, the woman who was talking before, Um, which is, again, anger is information for you. Anger is a part of you and it's showing up with anger because it's trying to tell you something. It's trying to protect you, manage you, get you somewhere. Um, That's the tough thing about relationships and the tough thing about loving an addict. You cannot control him. There's no amount of threats or anger or begging and pleading and love that would choose someone to get recovery, to stop being, you know, lying, manipulative, uh, et cetera. You know, the behaviors that always come with addiction. So that anger is there for a reason. It's got fears, it's got hurt, it's got disappointment. um, And you really need to spend some time with it and figure out if this partner, if this fiance cannot give these things to you, if they can't give you you know, I'm going to always do my best. I'm going to always be honest. I'm going to, if I lie, I'm going to tell you in the next 24 hours. Um, I'm going to be a man or woman of my word so much that you feel less of a constant anxiety or like you need to check the credit card statements or email or text messages all the time. Those are physical cues in your body that this person is living in alignment with his or her promises and they're saying what they mean, mean what they say. Like I said, another big sign of recovery for addicts are that they have this contextual understanding of why they did what they did. They have emotional intelligence now. Oh, when I get really anxious or when I get really insecure, these are things that I go out and do now. Instead, I'm going to go to a meeting. I'm going to go talk to my sponsor. I'm going to go, you know, I'll, I'll get security and validation and a more productive healthier way. I'll tell you when I'm in that state because I have body physical awareness that it's happening. So, you know, you're saying, how do I communicate to him that this is not okay? My guess is you've communicated to him many, many times that this is not okay. 
uh, you're just not getting the response that you want. And like I said, anger is the cue for wanting to change your current state. You know, anger is that this isn't okay and I need something different to happen. The big question is, is this person able to help you create that new environment, that safe environment, get you the things that your body needs? You know, he's kind of saying that, like, I need to figure out if you're okay with this way because I'm not sure when I'm going to get better. You have to ask yourself, are you okay with hanging around while he continues these behaviors, while he might not be executing recovery in the way that you should be executing recovery? Questions to ask. Yeah. Well, and I, you know, I got to tell you, I, I read truth in what he's, you need to figure out if you're okay with these feelings, because I don't know how long it'll take me to get better. None of all of us addicts would like to go, well, in 90 days, we're going to be, it isn't the reality. I, I think the bigger question is, can you step back and look and are you seeing action for him? for your fiance to change. If you are, maybe you've got some hope. You know, I mean, addicts who are taking action to do things differently, who are working a program and, and working on getting better, you'll see the breadcrumbs of, you know, how things are moving forward. You know, if he's like, well, I just don't know how long I'm going to get better, but I'm not doing anything like the, the previous question was like, he's still flirting. He's still doing all of these things. To me, I'd be going, hmm, I don't hear I don't hear any, you know, positive action to move forward with it. But, you know, with this one, I'm like, I mean, that's a, a bet. I was like, that's at least honest that that person is going, I, I don't, I don't know what the journey is. You know, I, I um, share with addicts kind of regularly, you know, when somebody's um, hurt, you know, rather than shutting down like the person that, or getting angry, like the person shared earlier, you know, uh, something to try is to say, I'm sorry that my past behavior has hurt you so bad that I have not been trustworthy. I am working today to do things that will be better so that I don't return to that. And, you know, that I can, you know, I can grow and change, but it's a journey and there's no magic fix. Now you're, it's a fiance. I, I, to me, I mean, I'm an addict, so I know lots of addicts. I know lots of addicts in recovery. And those of us that are doing our work, you know, we have the capacity to grow and change. We actually are people that want to grow and change. People that aren't addicts, you know, are less mo motivated. They don't have to, you know, they, you know, they're in a different place. So, so to me, it's challenging. I get it to love an addict, but you know, the rewards can really be there too. You can have a deeper relationship, you know, with somebody who's actually doing the recovery work, you know, then, then you can imagine, but it comes with a whole bunch of speed bumps and, and, you know, all the, you know, all the, I'm going to, pardon my language, all the crap you're dealing with, you know, with this as well. So, so I'm sorry for that. Um, but I think really looking at, what actions are you seeing? You know, may, maybe there's room for hope, you know, for you. So, um, oh, efforts are extremely inconsistent. That's very telling. That's why I'm struggling so much. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that actually is really telling it. It really is about the action. So mm -hmm. I am sorry. And that's probably data for you. So, oh, there's a question in the queue. Yeah. One last one. Okay. I have a question on boundaries. My husband has expressed that he is involved in illegal dealings. Oh, geez. Hinted to theft and transport. I don't know. And we have a newborn and toddler. I have told him he may not have the kids without supervision. He's mad at me for making this boundary and blames me for the boundary. I am angry that he puts our family in this situation. Is there a way to create boundaries that don't seem like we are trying to control the attic? Um, yeah, I mean, a really quick question is, do you feel like you have to have this boundary in place to keep your children safe? Have there been indications that you think your partner is either putting himself in danger or has dangerous or concerning people around him in his life, right? Um, indiscrepancies or bad choices are a huge red flag. If you're willing to do things illegal, then that means you're gonna be hanging out with other people who are willing to do things illegal. Um, illegal behaviors, you get other illegal behaviors. Will there be drugs? Will there be guns? Will there be, right? Um, and those are all things that have created fear in me about my children and my children's safety. So, I mean, 
he is allowed to whatever emotion he wants. He can definitely be angry. God knows we all get angry at boundaries that people set around us. But um, are you doing it for your kid's safety? Um, I mean, is this a higher issue too? Do you need to be talking to a therapist or, you know, taking legal action? You might want to consult with therapist and or social worker and or a lawyer to figure out um, how to keep your kids safe, right? Kids safety always has to be paramount above all else, even if someone is angry about a boundary. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Chris. And great to see you. So we'll see you the second week of September. Yep. So join us all then. Um, check out kristensnowden.com uh, for her betrayed partner work and more stuff on our website. So thanks everybody. And take a minute to go to my website, kristensnowden.com. Join my mailing list. You can be informed of any future free webinars and other webinars and events that I hold along with some live workshops and courses that I have on my website. I promise I won't inundate you with a bunch of email, but um, I really work hard to provide a lot of resources for all of you to help you learn to get to that healthier place internally, individually, and relationally with those that you love. Thank you for your time. So glad you joined us and I'll see you next month in September.